Hey guys, this is section 10.4, compound events. And before we get into talking about what a compound event is, um, I'm going to show you kind of how they're useful. And uh, so we're going to look at at a few locks here, a few locks that some of you guys might even have seen before, maybe you purchased before for a sports locker. And uh, ultimately what we're gonna do is we're gonna see which of these locks is the um, safest to use, that maybe the least hackable, right? So, um, so we don't want someone just guessing what our combination is. So let's look at the first lock here. This lock has three wheels. Each wheel is numbered from zero through nine. So it says the least possible or least three-digit combination possible. Well, if I can make it zero, 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 that would definitely be the smallest. And it says the greatest three-digit pos uh, combination possible would be uh, 999. And it says how many different possible combinations are there then? Well, you would think 999, but we're starting at zero. Um, so we have to include that. So there's actually 1,000 different combinations that you could set this lock for. So it's pretty safe, pretty secure, not very good probability of someone being able to crack into that. Um, letter B says, use the lock in part A. There are blank possible outcomes for the first wheel. Well, um, for the first wheel, I can do anything from zero to nine. So that's, let's see, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's actually 10 numbers. Um, one through nine, obviously, is nine. And then zero, you have to add that one in there. So there's 10 possible combinations for the first wheel. There's also 10 for the second wheel and then 10 for the third wheel. And it says, how can you use multiplication to determine the possible number of, of combinations? Well, if I do 10 times 10 times 10, I get 1,000. So that's extremely helpful. We're going to talk more about this, but that's extremely helpful because that's a much easier way to get my answer of a thousand different combinations than to think of how many different ones there are like I did up here. So I'd much rather just be able to multiply the combinations together. For part C here, it says this lock is numbered uh, 0 through 39. Each combination uses three numbers in a left-right-left pattern, much like your lockers at school. How many combinations are there? Well, if there's 0 through 39, that would be 40 different possible possibilities. Uh, remember, 1 through 39 would be 39, and then you have to add 0. So every time there's a 0 involved, you always have to add 1 to that. There we go, plus one. So if I have to do three of these, right, because it's a left, right, left pattern, then that would be 40 times 40 times 40. Now four times four is 16 times four is 64. So this would make 64 followed by three zeros. So this lock has 64,000 different combinations. Compare that to the one up above that only had 1,000. And then combination D, it says wheel one is a zero through nine. Well, that's 10 different possibilities. Wheel two is a letter wheel, A through J. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. That's also 10. K through T is also 10. And then zero through nine we know is 10. So then I would multiply 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. And that's going to give me 10,000, a one followed by four zeros. So we have up here, we have a lock that has 1,000 different combinations. Here we have one that has 64,000. And then down here we have one that has 10,000. So for part E, it says, uh, for which lock would be most difficult to guess the combination? It would definitely be um, lock C, this one here. So all of that's going to be useful for today's lesson. Um, so to start, well, start off with, let's look at some vocab. Um, the sample space is the set of all possible outcomes of an, a one or more events. One or more, that's being the key there. Because so far, we've only been looking at the probability of one event. For example, I could say, what's the probability of spinning a six? Right. So now we're going to look at what's the probability of spinning a six and then spinning a one right after that. So we're going to look at more events than that. That's why it's called compound events. You can use tables or tree diagrams to find the sample space. 
So for this example, it says you randomly choose a crust and then a style of pizza. Find the sample space. So when we find the sample space, we're actually going to make a list or as the instructions set up here, a tree diagram that gives all the different possibilities. So I'm just going to start with the crust. I've already wrote T and S and T stands for thin crust and S stands for stuffed crust. So that's the first choice we make is we have to choose what kind of crust. After that, we have to choose a style. So you can choose a thin crust Hawaiian pizza. You can choose a thin crust Mexican pizza, a thin crust pepperoni pizza, or a thin crust veggie pizza. You could also choose a stuff, or sorry, yeah, stuffed crust Hawaiian, a stuffed crust Mexican, a stuffed crust pepperoni, or a stuffed crust veggie. And so what we've done is we've made a tree diagram. You can see the little branches coming off of the T and the S. And so we have four possibilities for uh, the thin crust. And then we have four possibilities for the stuffed crust. So when it says how many different pizzas are possible, we would say there's eight different possible pizzas. And we could list them all out, thin, Hawaiian, thin, Mexican, thin pepper. But we've got the list right there, and we can see there's eight. Now, what we're going to talk about in just a second is we're going to talk about what we did on the last page of the notes when we worked with those locks. Um, if I have two choices to make, then I'm going to multiply two numbers together. There are two different types of crust, and there are four different types of styles. So if I do two times four, that's a much easier way to get eight than it would be to have to list them all out. So what I just did in that last example was called using the fundamental counting principle. And so the funding, fundamental counting principle is helpful to find the total number of outcomes. And what you do is you just multiply. You're going to multiply the outcomes of each event together. So that's what this says. Now, the cool thing about the fundamental counting principle is that it can be used for more than just two events. So let's say I had to pick a crust, pick a veggie on my pizza, and then pick a meat. Well, I could just multiply the three different numbers together for the meats, veggies, and crusts. So you just multiply them together, and that's the key idea from today's lesson. So it says find the total number of possible outcomes um, in of rolling a number cube, which is just a six-sided die, and flipping a coin. And you can see there's one and two different events. So I'm going to be multiplying two numbers together. Now, I could find the sample space, right? I could say, well, I could flip heads on the coin and then roll a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, and a six. Or I could roll tails on the, or flip tails on the coin and then roll a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, or a six. And then I could add these up and say, well, that's six plus six, that's got to be 12. Or, the easier way, there's two possible outcomes on the coin, heads and tails. There's six possible outcomes on the number cube, one through six, and that's a much easier way to use 12. And this is using the fundamental counting principle and using multiplication. This question says, at a sub shop, you can choose ham, turkey, or roast beef on either white or wheat bread. You randomly choose a meat, and then you choose a bread. So you choose a meat, there's your first choice, and then you choose a bread, there's your second choice. So I have two different choices that I'm making, and I'm going to multiply them together. Now, for the meats, there's ham, turkey, and roast beef. There's three different types of meats. For the breads, there's white bread or wheat bread. So there's two different choices for bread, and that's going to give me six total um, possibilities. Now this one says also find the sample space. Well, I'm going to choose my bread as either white bread, I guess I have to do W-H-I, and then W-H-E would be wheat bread, and then I've got ham, turkey, or roast beef, and then ham, turkey, and roast beef. So I've got my three plus three, which is six different possibilities. So this is my sample space, sample space. And then this is my total number of outcomes, which would be six. Find the total number of possible outcomes of rolling two number cubes. Now this one doesn't say find the sample space. So all I have to do is multiply together. So I'm rolling two number cubes. So I'm going to multiply two numbers together. On the first number cube, there will be the numbers 1 through 6, so there's 6 possibilities. And then on the second number cube, there's also 1 through 6. 
So that means there's 36 ways that I can roll two dice. Now, um, on the bonus question on yesterday's quiz, we actually talked about the 36 different possible possibilities, and then the bonus had you figure out which sum was the greatest. All right, next question says, how many different outfits can you make from t-shirts, jeans, and shoes? So we have three different choices we're making. A t-shirt choice, multiply that by the number of jeans, multiply that by the number of shoes. So let's go with t-shirts. Looks like we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven t-shirts. The number of jeans, we have one, two, three, four jeans. And the number of pairs of shoes, remember, so this would be one pair, two pairs, and three pairs. So I would just multiply. Um, in all the other problems, we've only had two numbers multiplied. In this one, we have three choices, so three numbers. Seven times four is 28, and 28 times three, and that's going to give us 84. So we have 84 different possible outfits that we could make. Now, they may not all match, right? But we have 84 different possible outcomes we could make. All right, this is actually not so bad, right? Just, just multiplying the possibilities together. This one says find the total number of possible outcomes of spinning the spinner and then choosing a number 1 through 5. So I'm making two choices. Um, I'm going to spin the spinner. And look at the spinner. How many different ways could you spin that spinner? There's blue, green, yellow, and red. So there's four different ways you could spin the spinner. And then numbers one through five, one, two, three, four, five, that's five numbers. So there's 20 different ways that I could do that. If I wanted to make a list, it would be blue one, blue two, blue three, blue four, blue five, green one, green two, and so on and so forth. But it doesn't say that I need the sample space. It just wants to know how many so that we can take a shortcut and just write 20. Next one says, how many different outfits could you make from four t-shirts? It's nice when they give us the number. Whoops. Let's try this again. Four t-shirts, five pairs of jeans, and five pairs of shoes. Well, five times five is 25, and 25 times four is 100. So there's 100 different outfits we can make. This is really easy, just multiplying them together. All right, now is when we're going to um, blend this and kind of merge this with the probability that we've been working on this chapter. So a compound event consists of two or more events. And so we're still finding the probability, um, the number of favorable outcomes over the number of possible outcomes. What we're going to do is we're going to merge that with the fundamental counting principle, and we're just going to multiply probabilities together. For example, this one says you roll a number cube and you flip a coin. What's the probability of rolling a number greater than four and flipping tails? So let's think. I have, I'm doing two things, right? I'm rolling a number cube, I'm flipping a coin. That means I'm going to have two different numbers, but since this is probability, that means I'm going to have two different fractions. So instead of multiplying just numbers together, uh, the probability comes in here, we're going to multiply fractions together. So the probability of rolling a number that's greater than 4. So for numbers greater than 4, we've got 5 and 6. So there's a 2 6 chance that I'm going to roll a number that's greater than 4. And then it says you flip a coin, the probability of getting tails. Well, there's a 1 half chance that I get tails. So I just multiply these probabilities together, right? I can cancel the 2 6 to make that 1 third. 1 times 1 is 1, and 3 times 2 is 6. So there's a 1 6 chance that I roll a number that's greater than 4 and flip tails at the same time. So when I, all I have to do is multiply. Instead of finding one probability, I'm finding two, and I just multiply them together to get my final answer of 1 sixth. This one says, what's the probability of rolling an even number and flipping heads? So an even number, well, that would be 2, 4, and six, right? So I'm doing two things again. So here's my two fractions. Um, there's a three out of six chance, or you can right away just reduce that th to one half. There's a one half chance that I roll an even number. And then there's also a one half chance that I'm going to flip heads on the coin because there's one out of two total possibilities there. And so one half times one half gives me one fourth. And so I'm just multiplying those fractions together. 
So I thought I would take a time out right here and kind of come back to that fundamental counting principle we were talking about. Um, so we talked about lock combinations, right? Well, now let's look at computer passwords. Um, I, I get really frustrated because I always have to end up changing my password and they always come up with these new rules. Well, the reason for that is because computer passwords have the ability to be almost unhackable, right? They should be. Um, so let's talk about how just adding digits changes the number of possible passwords someone would have to guess. Um, so what if someone um, said your password has to be four digits? Now digits mean numbers, right? So zero through nine. Well, you'd have 10 options for the first one times 10 options for the second one times 10 options for the third one and 10 options for the fourth one. There'd be 10,000 different passwords you could come up with all the way from 0000 to 9999. There's 10,000 different combinations there. So pretty good, right? Like a, uh, that's why pretty safe when they give you a four digit pin code for a debit card. And then, or your, or your four digit code for an iPad or iPhone, for example. Um, part B says uh, the password must have five digits. Well, that would be 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. Now, for those of you that have scientific calculators, you have an exponent button on your calculator. This is just 10 to the fourth, whereas in problem B here, that'd be 10 to the fifth. So you might find it easier just to do 10 to the fifth, and that's going to give us 100,000. Just so, just by making it have an extra digit, you've increased the number of possible possible passwords to 100,000, making it even harder for someone to crack or to hack that passcode. Part C, the password must have six letters. Now, okay, think about this. Letters, how many letters are there? All right, in the alphabet, there's 26. And you're choosing six. So 26 times 26 times 26 times 26 times 26 times 26. That's going to be a huge number, right? Way more than what we've been, had so far. Um, you could just type 26 to the sixth power into your um, calculator, six being the number of times you are multiplying 26. And that's going to be 308 million, oh my gosh, 915,776. That is a ton of possible passwords that you could come up with. And then here we come to the last one. And the last one's like the most common computer password that you have. That It must be eight characters long, and it can be digits, which we know there's 10, or it can be letters. So altogether, that means there's 36 different possible choices if you choose a number or if you choose a letter. And then we're going to multiply that eight times, right? So I'm just going to keep, I'm going to save some space here and just say that's 36 to the eighth power. Now, I'm not going to take the time to write this whole number down, but we're looking at approximately 2.8 trillion, that's trillion with a T, trillion different possible passwords you could have. Now, think a lot of companies make you have a capital letter or more than capital letters. So if you could do capital letters, that would double the number of letters because capital letters would be small or would be different from the lowercase letters. Some of them make you use symbols like exclamation points or squigglies or whatever. So just think how crazy it is. There should be no way that your computer password should ever be hacked. But of course, we know it does happen because instead of choosing these uh, you know, crazy passwords that you could possibly have like this one here, people make it, you know, password one. All right, so it's extremely hackable, but it shouldn't be. All right, it's homework question time, and I've got a couple to go over with you guys from tonight's homework. Number 25 is the first one up. It says you randomly guess the answers to two questions, I'm going to underline that, on a multiple choice test. Each question has three choices, A, B, or C. What is the probability that you guess the correct answer to both questions? You are guessing twice, so I'm going to write down two fractions. The number of fractions always matches the number of choices you make. All right, so two questions, two choices, two fractions. The probability that you get question one correct, well, there's one correct answer out of the three possibilities. So there's a one-third chance that you get question one correct. You're going to guess on the second question. There's also a one-third chance on the second question, and that's going to make one-ninth, right? One times one is one, and then three times three is nine. It says, write that probability as a percent, round your answer to the nearest tenth. To turn a fraction into a percent, you do top divided by bottom, which is going to give you a decimal. That's going to give us 0.1111. It just keeps repeating, right? The one just goes on forever. So I'm going to move that decimal two spots to the right to make it a percent. 11%, but it says round to the nearest tenth. So 11.1%. 11 .1%. Part B says, suppose you eliminate one of the choices for each question. 
right? Like you're smart, so you know it's not option B for the first one. Maybe you know it's not option C for the second one because you've eliminated some. Well, how would that increase your probability? Well, if you can eliminate one of the choices, you would make this two. You'd make it a one out of two, right? So if you know one of the answers isn't right automatically, then you have a one out of two chance of getting it right. And same for the next question. You have a one out of two, which means you'd have a one-fourth or 25% chance. So you increase your percentage quite a bit to 25%. So that would be the option, first option here. Number 26 is very similar. It says you forget the last two digits of your password for a website, kind of like what we were just talking about. What's the probability that you randomly guess those correct digits? Well, digits is the key word here. Those are numbers 0 through 9, and there are 10 digits, right? Every time you hear the word digits, just think that's 10 possibilities. 0 through 9 is 10 numbers. What's the prob probability that you randomly guess those correct digits? Well, you forgot the last two, so you're going to guess twice. Here's a fraction for the first guess. Here's a fraction for the second guess. There's a one out of 10 chance that you're gonna guess the right digit, right? Because only one of those is right for the, four, for the next to last digit and on, only one correct number for the last digit. So one tenth times one tenth gives me one one hundredth. That's the probability that I guess right. Not very good chance. In fact, as a percent, one divided by 100 is just literally 0.01 which when you move it over twice is 1%. 1 percent. One one hundredth, that makes sense, right? Percents are out of 100, would be 1%. Part B, suppose you remember uh, that both digits are even. How does that affect, or how does this change the probability? Well, even numbers, we've got 0, 2, 4, 6, and 8. So 5 out of the 10 numbers are even. So if you know that it's even, then you have a 1 out of 5 chance because instead of making the denominator 10 like we did up here, you've eliminated um, the odd numbers. You know they're both even, so you have a 1 out of 5 times another 1 out of 5, and that's going to give you a 1 out of 25th chance. 1 divided by 25 gives me 0 0.04 or 4%, and the one that says that is, again, the first option. Number 28, your model train has one engine and eight train cars. Find the total number of ways that you can arrange them. We're going to use the fundamental counting principle here because I am definitely not going to make a tree diagram and list out all the possible combinations. That would take forever. So my model train has eight train cars. The engine has to go first, right? So the engine's always first. I'll put that here. E stands for engine. And then I have eight choices to make. Five, six, seven, eight. So these little boxes represent, or little bars represent the train cars. So how many different ways could I do this? Well, um, when I'm building my train, I put the engine first, and then I have eight choices for that first car. Well, once I pick a car and put it there, that means I only have seven choices left for the second car. And then once I pick a, the second car, I've got six choices left for the third car. And then five choices. And you can see here we're you know, just going to keep going four choices and then three choices and then two choices because I've only got two left, right? And I choose one. And then finally, there's only one choice left for me to make. And the fundamental accounting principle says I just multiply these different choices together. So I'm making eight choices. I have eight numbers to multiply. And it goes down by one each time because I pick a train car and I, you know, it leaves one, le one less for me to do. And when you enter that into your calculator, that gives you 40,320 different ways that you could arrange your train. All right, and last question, number 29, says you have been assigned a nine-digit identification number. This is uh, basically your social security number, SSN, if you see that. if you When you get older for jobs and, and stuff, such, when you fill out applications, you always have to put that number down. You'll, you'll have it memorized at some point in your life. Um, but all of you have a social security number. It says, why should you use the fundamental counting principle instead of using a tree diagram? Well, it's not that making a tree diagram is impossible. It's that it would be way too large. Can you imagine all the different possibilities you could have for numbers? I mean, think about that. There's 10 digits, and you're choosing nine of them. So 10 to the ninth. So that's going to be, let's see, a one followed by nine zeros. So, oops, that comma's in the wrong spot. You've got one billion 
different combinations for a social security number. So right now in America, we only have, you know, 350 million. So we are nowhere near the 1 billion mark. And if we ever got 1 billion people like China does, we'd have to add an extra digit to our social security numbers, which I'm sure they will at some point, hopefully not in my lifetime. So it'd be way too large to make a tree diagram that has 1 billion branches, right? Um, so uh, we've already answered part B, um, 10, right? I've got nine choices, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. They're all tens. So I'll just not, I'll save you the time. We already did 10 to the ninth and that's 1 billion. That's a one followed by nine zeros. That's nine, that's 1 billion. And then part C says, use the internet to find out why the possible number of social security numbers is not the same as your answer to part B. Um, so we don't have 1 billion. There's not that many out there. And the reason for that isn't because they're not nine digits long. It's because most of the time your social security number is coded to a geograph geographical group or, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's similar to family members. So the reason we don't use all 1 billion different possible outcomes is because they're, they group them into a systematic, you know, um, set of numbers so that they can determine based on your ge geographical location or whatever group you're associated with, what your social security number will be.